welcome ricardo can you hear me yes i can hear you okay we are into the seventh session already half an hour into it and we are supposed to start with ricardo ricardo is from venezuela is a pop youth mentor and a journalist and a graphic designer and so many personalities together he is also one of the uh, direct impacties of climate change so ricardo is going to share with us some interesting things he is from venezuela Ricardo, I'll turn to you for the benefit of the younger audience. I'll request you to introduce yourself about the work that you do, and then uh, I guess you have a presentation to make. Yes, I have a presentation to make. Okay. Can you please okay. allow my computer to share a screen? Yes, sure enough. We have probably we have also a copy of the presentation. We can do it from here. Yes, yes, please make Ricardo co-host. Yes, your co-host now. My, my computer is Lander Academy. It's called Lander Academy. It's on my computer. Oh, your computer is also. Yeah, I'm sharing my. I'm share. I'm speaking through my phone. Yeah, my computer is Lander Academy. I sent a message. Uh, please, please, mm. Jake. Please uh, make Lander Academy co-host. It's the first computer that is joining our program in the entire show. So first of all, it's a pleasure to meet you all. Uh, it's been a wonderful meeting. I could join you through Facebook. I was listening to some very wonderful and amazing and so the information that this leader has shared. And I'm going to start with something of the video you share about the elephant. Investing people to invest in nature. And that's something that it has to do a lot with communication, which is a topic I'm going to I'm going to speak of today, speak about. Right. Ricardo, please please second. introduce yourself so younger audience knows yeah. about you and your. Give me some work. seconds. <laughs> so I'm 19 years old, member of Pop. I'm a pop youth mentor from Valencia, Venezuela. Right. I engage with communications and nature. I'm very given to protecting our planet as well as protecting our people through education and through the best way of communication. I think communication is just a great opportunity to produce a bigger impact and a more meaningful impact to our planet. So I'm going to speak a little bit about that one. I'm a journalist, right? Currently taking a concentration on social communication in the University of Arturo Michelena which is a local university in my community. So I'm going to start with the importance of media for the successful implementation of sustainable projects. If I lost my signal, just let me know, all right? And I'm going to start by pointing out that if it's not in the media, then it does not exist, even though it exists, okay? And before we start, I want to clarify that if by media you're exclusively thinking about um, TV, television, radio, newspapers, let's put three dots right there and expand that vision as media is only the plural form of medium, right? Medium is anything that is between you and the people you are targeting. It can be, for example, art, it can be, for example, in any WhatsApp group. It can be, for example, an event. It's anything that is between you and the people you are targeting. Okay? So, as long as the information multiplies, it doesn't die halfway through. That's an important key. The information doesn't have to die halfway through. Okay? We have to keep that information moving. We have to keep that information expanding in order for us to benefit of it, okay? So, in my experience collaborating and interacting with international organizations, non-profit organizations mostly, I realized there's like a big plan space between working towards sustainability and actually achieving sustainability. And that's in a space that can only be fulfilled by the media factor. Okay, so small organizations are the ones who struggle the most with this, uh, with this poem, 
because the smaller the organization, the smaller the chances for any project to, to reach the masses. And therefore, the smaller the chances to possibly make a wider impact and also obtain a long-term sustainability for their projects. Okay? So, does this mean that organizations, um, are big organizations, are the only one in the position to provide a positive change through the implementation of their projects? So, my answer to that is no. Okay, when it comes to, to climate action, the more people that join the cause uh, to, and take action actually is the better for the world itself. And we need to externalize that cause to reach communities. Okay, that's our target communities. And for that, we need both. We need the small as well as we need big companies, right? Big organization, big association, because they both reach community different way. And that's something quite important if we actually want to make a change, to understand how these um, organizations cooperate and reach out to communities. So, and by organization, I also want to point out that, I mean, any kind of association from a close group to students to, um, to big companies such as Microsoft, for example, doesn't merge the size, you know? At the end of the day, as uh, leaders have taught us, it's only needed one person to start the movement, but no person alone can actually effectuate change. And so keep that in mind. I'm going to take as an example Greta Thunberg, who was only 50 years old, when she sat alone outside the Swedish parliament holding a sign. A small action that they start a massive worldwide and sustainable project in the form of the joyful move. How did she do it? Greta and her team knew for sure that in order to externalize the Fridays for Future uh, cause, they were gonna need the help of traditional and not traditional forms of media. And she made a wonderful use of media in order, in order to turn Fridays for Future into what we already know, and it's worldwide known, okay? Nevertheless, there is a tendency for all organizations, no matter the size um, of them, to fail in their goals in a long-term road for saying so how, because um, we all need to grow and expand. And when we call our organization, we're talking about people, and we all need to expand or people, we, wanna, we need to expand our communities. So the reason why we call many of the initiatives movement is because they need movement, they need synergy to remain relevant and operative. The good news is that we can actually affect this um, tendency and give our projects that key start they need to be sustainable and better implemented. Also, I want to make a parenthesis to define two words that the English language doesn't have and that will help you with this conversation. In Spanish, we have two different translations for the word sustainability, right? One is sustentabilidad and the other one is sostenibilidad. Sustainable, uh, sustentabilidad refers to a state of something that can be maintained at a certain rate or level but needs an external force uh, for that. For example, we can imagine a wheel. In the case of sustainability, that wheel will, we will need to push that wheel in order for it to move, for rotate, right, to spin. But when it comes to sustainability, it's actually the same with the difference that it doesn't need external force, right? It rotates by itself, it spins by itself. And that's what we need to to look for sustainability, no sustainability, right? So we need to achieve this because we are simply non-eternal, okay? At the moment, either you or your team are no longer able to provide um, and spend time, intellectual, economical resources on your project, it will definitely basically die. 
So the moment that thing you work so much into, you put all your passion and you put all your effort, the moment when you are not there, that project will come to an end. And we're not looking at that. We're looking for projects that are sustainable, right? We're looking for sustainability, not sustainability. Besides any project that you work um, for and for the benefit of others, is a present that you are giving from you to the world and it needs to remain so, okay? So now closing this, um, let's say, is parenthesis. Some time ago, I was sitting in an office during a meeting with the greatest mind of my state, okay? Not because I was one of them, I'm just a curious young man. And they were talking about this amazing project, actually. It was a room full of headmaster, university headmasters, uh, economists, scientists, engineers, everyone around 60 years old, and I was the only one below 20. So the more they talk, the more I broke down. You know, I was cultivated by everything they said. And when they finished, they asked for my own opinion. Uh, I was almost shaking. What could I possibly say to this uh, wonderful mind, to these people with such preparation, uh, with such background that they already don't know? So I breathed in, I breathed out, and I stood up. I took my nose. And the first thing that came outside my mouth was communications deficit. Why? Because they did not consider the media factor. In other words, they did not consider uh, taking advantage of the massive possibilities that the mass communications will offer to our project and our initiative. Okay? They did not speak of reaching out to news platform or executing any media strategy. So for me, it was not meant to be sustainable. None of their projects were meant to be sustainable in the long time road. The truth is that for any project to actually flower, it needs, the, it needs to travel through the mouths of people. And I don't mean two people, I don't mean 20 people, I don't mean 50 people, okay? I mean thousands and thousands of people, okay? A massive amount of people. Because um, it, when the information is going on, all right, the very result we're saying, so we cannot let that information die. We cannot let it die. We cannot let the news, we have to keep up pushing our presence in the news. We have to keep pushing our communication, externalize it, right? Since the human point of view we could say so of course we need some key figures in our projects to help um, help us to deliver it to help us grow such as advisors and investors um, maybe politicians for some organizations but we actually actually need to target the masses for projects to exist and obtain that impact which is wider and the impact we actually want to share. So the only way through is called media, right? And besides, mm, it's the truth that the more um, people's attention your project, uh, your project carries, uh, the easier it will be for you to develop it because it will open the door for you. And that leads me to a point which is one of the reasons why it's so important the media for a project. One of them is money. Your project does need money in order to maintain itself. It needs funding, it needs to pay taxes, it needs reinvestment. And even though you tell me that your project is maybe totally cost-free, if you want to grow, you will need at least to have a close team to support you. And support your cost because as long as eating is something so necessary, we will meet the first person that is willing to work uh, full-time, pay-free. That's impossible. And the second reason why media is so important is because of a backup community, right? Media allows you to form a backup community, which is the name I use to refer to the social consumers of any project. 
all right? And the ones that are aware and well informed of this that you do, and most importantly, the ones that consume what you offer and what you're doing. And so they also let us to, they also allow us for, to make that information travel from mouth to mouth and turn our project into something relevant, which is at the end of the day, what we're looking for. We need our projects to be relevant to the people, right? To all people, because we are, um, we are trying to, we are trying to produce a positive change in the world in terms of climate. And we actually need more people. And we have to make it relevant. We cannot do this alone. So I'm going to put as an example these two scenarios. So the first scenario is that you see an advertisement, advertisement while browsing in Google. And that's promoting an energy event and ask the users to join. So, and the second scenario is, for example, your friends comes to you and ask you to attend together to the event. Then I ask you, who are you more likely to pay attention to? Now imagine the next scenario. You were to that uh, event and there, were, and there was a lack of people. And then I asked you, would you really go again to that event? The same applies to any project. And here's where the idea of a backup community becomes so handy. No matter what is your initiative about, you need people to, to back your efforts. There are simply non-refutable proof of your work. And they can be manifested maybe in, as followers in social media platforms, as active followers, or in person activities as attenders. It's the audience who provides a sense of trust in what we offer, all right? And they are the ones that lead our project to reach new borders and actually evolve, which is something very important to evolve. So the moment you go and ask for funding, the moment you are more uh, likely, is the moment you are more likely to say, or the moment whether you are looking for a partner, that's the moment where you are more likely to find someone to support more directly and internally your cause. So the, the truth of this is that media carries people, right? And we need people to successfully implement our project. So now, how do we use media in our favor? And I'm going to give three recommendations for that. The first one, is I do recommend you to always get in touch with communication specialists in or any area to assist you, depending on what you are looking for, what are your goals, what are your expectations, so they can, uh, they can help you to find ways to plan that uh, communication strategy that can actually kickstart your project. Okay, so communication is just a very, very, very large playground. So, Limit that idea of what you're really looking for to choose wisely and accurately. So for example, does your organization or project need to be um, more aesthetically when it comes to the presentation? So go to a graphic designer. Does it need a better internal communication? Or, uh, I don't know, measurement. Go for a corporate communica communicators. Do they, for example, need a more external approach than pick an institutional journal? So we have to do our research when it comes to the area of communication we actually want to explore and develop. And there's no need for it to be an exaggerated amount of money to spend, but anything we do must be accurated and well meditated in order for us to make the very possible decision for projects and organizations to grow because media is just a trial and error process. It doesn't have, but it doesn't have to be a non-deliberated one. In Venezuela, we have this um, saying, which is, it's better to have an insurance and not need it than actually needing it and not having it. So let's ensure ourselves with knowledge 
and the systems of a specialist. The second recommendation is start reaching out to the media as soon as you uh, know how to introduce your project in the best possible way. So it's a big, it's a big step and the most straightforward because I, there's no magic when it comes to this. I told you this is just a trial and error uh, process, but the more um, people you reach out to, uh, you will obtain better results. You will obtain at least, uh, for example, for 20 media centers, you ask for uh, a little moment, you will obtain two answers, but two answers will lead to mother or two other ones, two other ones, and it goes on. And actually, at the end of the day, is, is that real or sustainability that we are looking for? A uh, will that can maintain itself, that can maintain a project relevant. So it will uh, start in, so I recommend you to uh, start interacting and testing the possibilities uh, you have around you when it comes to media. For example, send a DM to a local radio, uh, to some newspaper or journalist you are known to. And they can provide you with contacts and you can benefit from their services. See it as a win-to-win -win action. Media right now is going through a crisis saying somehow because immediate information is such a big problem and actually uh, media is right now looking for more chances to make an income and generate an income. And the only way they can generate an income is by providing people information. So if your product is non-profitable, for example, then your possibilities of benefiting from these um, services, media services, can duplicate. As they are in no position to negate you or to forbid you the ways for it to expand, right? At the end of the day, we all know what's good for the world and we all know what's good, what's going on. And most importantly, journalists know what's going on. And they will always find ways actually to speak the truth. And that's what we are looking for. We are looking for allies people who can speak the truth, people who can um, take our message out, and that's what we need. But in order for that, um, remember, I would the synergy, don't stop moving, keep reaching out to, to media centers, and remember that media is only the, is only the plural form of medium, which is anything between you and the people you are targeting. So perhaps, Platforms such as TikTok or Twitter are a good way to start. So give it a try. And the third um, recommendation is do not confirm. Do not confirm with your achievement. achievement. Sometimes uh, we let ourselves be blindfolded by our vision of the project itself. Or by the first pieces of success um, that are so rewarding that we end up, um, we miss the point of how to communicate that, that vision to an audience we want to reach out. So we are not, when we do that, we're not letting our vision to evolve, which is so important as I told you to evolve. And it's a, a very moment when your project uh, reach, achieves comfort, the moment your project is more likely to fail on the long road. So the journalists, Juliana Assange said that non-conformity is the only real passion worth being ruled by. It's okay to be proud of what we create, either it's a new form of thinking, a new product, or for a brand, or maybe an artifact that is providing, providing valuable solutions to the current climate change crisis. Um, it's okay as soon as you know you haven't reached your full potential because we can do better. And the better we do, the better people and the year will benefit. So that was my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you so much. That's very enlightening how you connected media and uh, what we do together. Thank you so much. Uh, Ricardo, uh, you come from a very interesting country, Venezuela. So, and uh, you are a journalist also, you are a graphic designer also, and obviously you are working for the Fox as a youth mentor. So, you know, there are some striking uh, natural properties that are common to Venezuela and India. They're both naturally very rich. 
Yes. Yes. So, can you tell us something about the place you live in and the environment surrounding it? So, something about the place I live in. Um, I live in Valencia, which is like the third uh, largest uh, city in Venezuela. Um, we've been uh, experiencing some very uh, horrible uh, floods because of the recent uh, raining. Rains, um, more for being more specifically about some of the things we experienced here, is that some of the wall from a building, uh, from a parking lot of the building, just fell down because of the flood. And I live very near to mountains because Valencia, is, you have a lot of mountains, right? We basically live in mountains. So, uh, for the place I live in, it gets a lot of white fire. And it's actually been affecting a lot of community, uh, community. Right now, I'm working with some organization, by the way, Projects for Future in Central Region, in order to develop investigation, all right, uh, to determine, uh, determine ways we can move forward when it comes to the welfare, which is right now one of the most, um, let's say, top problems we are experiencing here in my city. Okay. And um, it has actually been, it's kind of, uh, I wouldn't say funny because it's not funny, but it's absurd somehow. Because for those wildfires are mainly produced uh, because of army actions, military actions that, or or the forces that are supposed to take care of you are the, actually the ones that are affecting us. Uh, it's not like the problems Venezuela is right now going through. It is not like the censorship we are actually going through. Since uh, some couple of months to now, it has been a little bit better, saying somehow, because we have tens of dollars. But actually, we've been living a lot. And more recently, uh, the good part is that our governing has to recognize the climate exchange and is actually looking for ways we can, um, we can, let's say somehow, reduce impacts because of of the global warming in my region. More specifically, as you know, we also have a lot of uh, beaches and, and lagoons and many water bodies. And we are losing them, basically. And we're also losing all the species we have around. So right now in Venezuela, uh, there's an ongoing, um, uh, there's an ongoing problem when it comes to political area, when it comes to the youth, when it comes to environment, when it comes to many things, but the good part is that we are doing a great job and actually the government um, has given us an opportunity to speak up about it and to deliver a change uh, in our cities. And that's something I'm very, um, in very emotional, so how emotional, because they, they provide us a way to, to speak up for us, right? We cannot do this here. Uh, we cannot reach out directly to our government because of the problem we are living, but the government has allowed us to do that. And that's something wonderful, the opportunity to speak up, the opportunity to communicate, and the opportunity to do something great to the world. So I think that can be <laughs> part of a yeah, good situation. You, right? Yeah, we. I talk, I asked that question because it's such an interesting country to be in, and uh, with lots of natural resources, lots of natural beauty, and lots of Raji, nice, a lot of cool and uh, nice people. Yes, I yes, think, uh, Yeah, I think one of my students she want to ask one question. Shadha, are you okay. ready for that? Yes, please raise your hand. My question for you is, like, there's a line that is by Albert Einstein. The world as we have created, it is a process of our thinking. It cannot be changed without changing our thinking. So how can one change his or her thinking towards a sustainable environment? That's actually a very good question. Um, I think that we have to motivate ourselves with knowledge, right? We cannot let ourselves stop learning every single day. Maybe when our resources are low, and um, they are a bit uh, short or we have lack of resources to where we can access um, education but we have right now an amazing opportunity which is 
uh, social media, mass form of communications, we have the internet, we should just reach out to that um, window of opportunity uh, for us to change the way we think, because it's, it's not actually change the way we think, it's more like improving the way we think. And also it's just such a battle we have, we have to not only um, challenge ourselves, because when we are learning, we're challenging ourselves. It's, it's not easy to learn and it's not easy to accept what we are going on right now as a global community, okay? But we also have to, to face uh, the opinions of other people. And we have to apply the tolerance to listen to those opinions that some opinions will not be on our side. Some of them will be on our side. And we should focus on that and more specifically point. So I hope that answered your question. Thank you, sir. Such a nice answer. I would like to ask a question. Yes, please. Yes, please. So, uh, hello, sir. Me, Vanya. I have a question that, that in your opinion, what are the effectful, uh, effectful manner of uh, or method of the nature protection currently, uh, except from the uh, like tree plantation and all? Could you repeat the question? I have a bit of a problem with the signal. Okay. Uh, my question is that, in your opinion, what is the effectful, uh, effectful manner of uh, like nature protection currently, except from uh, like saving um, saving trees or growing more trees? That's also a good question because there are no one way to move forward, right? There are thousands of ways, and we actually can produce change, and we can we can do something better for a world without um, not necessarily doing. Um, the obvious things, okay? Of course, it's important. Uh, we, we have to follow um, the recommendation that people have shared with us. Uh, of course, it depends a lot on us, okay? But it, since the area where you educate yourselves and the area where you are actually in, in exploring, for example, in my case, is communication. So I'm trying to produce a positive change uh, from communication, all right? That's what I'm doing right now. So do you have to find that thing you want to explore and see a way it can, you can let somehow uh, share it, right? We, you can modify it to apply it to, to do a better world. I was, a, I, I was, I started as a teacher when I was really young. I started working as a teacher when I was 16 years old in my country because of the problem with, um, with the lack of teacher we have. We don't have a lot of professors in many schools where I'm going through many problems, okay? And one of the schools I was, it was a very, very little school, actually at the top of the mountain, no line. It was very beautiful, but we didn't have teacher. And I have a problem. We are not having teacher. What can we do? Uh, how can we, um, how can we move forward, okay? And I came up with the idea, let's just start uh, making a, volume, a volunteer process for saying somehow. And I started working as a teacher, right, for younger people. And other young people start um, joining the cause. And also it's very beautiful when you teach other people because you're actually teaching yourself and you have to educate yourself better. So in that way, we also find opportunities to talk about many things right, we talk about culture, to, uh, to talk about history, to talk about climate, to talk about environment. So there was this opportunity, right, and I just like modify it and apply it to my current situation. So that's the best way I can, I think. You know, it doesn't matter what you're doing because sometimes we think uh, we only have, we have to be scientists in order to talk about climate change. And the truth, we don't. We don't, we don't need to be scientists. We don't need to be, um, to be experts even. But what we need to do is no matter what you are doing to assess the current and um, to accept the current situation, okay, and find ways when you can provide solution from your point of view and from the position you are currently at. I hope that answered your question. <laughs> That's a very right question, so thank you. I think I have to learn some indie, you know. It's wonderful. Yes, we will learn from Hindi. You will learn from Venezuela. So, you got it? No. 
<laughs> actually, yeah, because yeah. I realized, sure. I realized um, the Indian people has to use such amazing accents, and it's been sometimes it's difficult to catch an accent because um, people in Venezuela don't speak English, and I speak English mostly because of movies, right? And we are still very uh, used to American accent, which is sounds a little bit flat, but when they but when you face other cultures or and other accents, which Johnson type of have allowed me to. And you start throwing these other accents, other way of things, you know, their cultures, you say, wow, I want to learn that. And I always find the way um, Indian people speak wonderful, even though there's a thousands of ways, but it's something I very like. Because you are closer to America, so you have American accent, you were occupied with Spanish, so you learned Spanish. Yes. Come, come closer to India and uh, you learn Hindi also and many, many other so I have also. to, I have to, I have to. <laughs> We have such so, a wonderful community of Indian people in Papua, and as, it's wonderful to work. I have spent them. some time in Latin America. We are very good friends over there in America, in Argentina, in Brazil, Chile, uh, Peru, and all this. Uh, we have spent some time over there. It's a beautiful culture that you have on the continent. And it's unlike any other continent. It's very, very, very different. So you're welcome to India anytime you come. Hopefully, we'll meet soon enough, and we'll learn some Hindi also. Yeah, sounds amazing. Also, you have a wonderful communication too. culture today. Okay. Thank you, Ricardo. Once again, I hope you stay with us. Meda is here. We are into her session. Meda, can you start your video? I'm surprised at the age you guys are doing so much thing. At your age, we did not know anything about anything. Seriously speaking, so so now the world has moved. Yeah. Welcome, Meda. I know that you have been waiting here for almost two, three hours. I saw your name there. Just switch on your audio, please. Uh, okay. Thank you so much, sir. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Malinga Meda Hope. I'm Ugandan. I'm currently living in Mexico. I'm doing my research today. Um, I pop youth mentor and um, ambassador for Africa. I'm more of a youth empowerment enthusiast, and I'm so passionate about issues to do with education and empowerment of masses. So um, I requested a friend of mine to help me share a screen, Nahid or Ricardo. Nahid has run away. I'm looking for her for quite some time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, she is she is she's back. She's she's there, yeah. back here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, back. Oh, okay, perfect. Letting me share my screen. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, you both of you are co-host. Nahid also and Meta also. Oh, Norma is also here. Welcome back. Okay. I was um, here without the camera. <laughs> <laughs> we have seen you were there without the camera. Thank you so much, Nahid. Um, so I'm presenting this together with a friend of mine. She's called Lois. I don't know if she has made it in here. Lois. Just, just uh, made yes. uh, interview. Nahid, Nahid, do you have your own presentation also? Um, <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be doing it by myself. Uh, uh, OK, OK. So we can do it together because you're slated before Meda. So I was looking for you then. So you can follow it up after if you have your own uh, presentation, so we can do it together. Fine, go ahead, please, Meta. Okay, so um, to make this presentation together with a friend of mine called Lois. Lois, um, please introduce yourself. Where is um, Lois? Let me bring him on the screen. Louis. Yeah, Lois, uh, just wait a second. Uh, Yes. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Lois Moy. I am Kenyan, and uh, I'm also interested. I'm, I'm, I've done some research on civic education, and so Meda reached out to me um, on the same. So uh, we'll be doing this presentation with her. Thank you. Okay, so um, basically, we uh, we have made this presentation on a general view because it's a global platform but otherwise the main aim was to 
present it at national level at a more entailed and detailed manner. So we had to edit a few things. So um, the title of our presentation is Civic Education, a major setback for Africa's development, which I do believe is not only an African issue, but um, probably there are other countries that, especially third world countries and other developing countries across the globe that are facing the same issue. So um, over now to Lois for the next slide. <laughs> Um, uh, the first question we need to ask ourselves is, what is civic education? Um, and so civic education refers to, um, next, next slide, please. Uh, the study of rights and obligations of, of citizens in society, and it's derived from civicus, meaning relating to a citizen. Um, so that's basically it. So um, basically, when you look at this definition, you have to ask yourself, who is a citizen, right? Um, I trust that most of us do know who a citizen is because we all are citizens. And um, we acknowledge the fact that we all are citizens because we legally belong to a specific country or specific countries. So um, in other words, civic education is very important for every citizen. Next slide, please. So um, while we're going through this, we decided to categorize civic education. Um, civic education is categorized into, based on our research, civic knowledge and skills, civic values and dispositions. Basically, um, this dispositions refers to a tendency of someone to behave in a certain way. In other words, it's more of like, it's not a natural decision. In most cases, it's um, because of what you have learned or um, because of certain situations, you decide to behave and conduct yourself in a certain manner. Um, and then civic behaviors, which is more of as a result of civic dispositions. So um, here we left it open for uh, audience involvement in case you do have anything to add please do let us know. Okay, to realize the importance of civic education, we need to acknowledge the problems it, it presents, including one, food insecurity, um, crime and violence. Okay, these are the results of having, uh, not having enough uh, awareness of, of, of your responsibilities and what you're supposed to contribute to uh, to enable your governance to to your government sorry to be in a better position or to to make better uh, choices. So as a result, we, we uh, there are these um, problems. So food insecurity, crime and violence, uh, environmental degradation and climate change. Uh, inadequate uh, sex education and orientation, unequal opportunities for role and bad governance, then injustices, oppression, and human rights abuse. Um, if I hope, I hope that's clear. If there's any any question, it, it can be brought up. Or yeah, that's it. Okay, so um, basically, when we look at civic education, we need to realize the fact that um, most of the problems that are being faced in society are as a result of um, the civic education setback. Um, in this case, uh, when we look at so many African countries, um, speaking for Uganda, Mauritius, um, South Sudan, actually out of 100% of the African countries, we shall put it at 95 or 96%. Um, civic education is not part of our curriculum except for international schools. Um, this to me makes it look more of like a biased situation. It's more of like um, a political advantage. So um, when you sit back and look, these are the problems that we are facing and um, if we are to address so many of these issues, um, issues to do with climate change, issues to do with um, insecurity and any form of injustice, then we need to put this into consideration. 
Next slide. Um, well, are these problems of society? Well, I just did acknowledge, yes, they are problems in society. Next slide. Um, is society actively engaged in addressing these problems? To be honest, no. Um, I'll give an example of my high school in Uganda. Um, I was a student in Gaza High School, and um, we have very brilliant young people who are so interested in issues to do with um, career orientation and everything. But like at the end of it all, if you're to ask someone, how are you going to impact your community with this career you're taking in? Maybe if someone wants to do um, medicine, if someone wants to do engineering or something like that, someone is focused on personal benefit and personal growth. There is no way someone is thinking of impacting the community, despite the fact that they do have the strength, they do have um, the knowledge, but because of lack of civic education, there are certain skills in them that have not yet been unfolded. So um, we are not actively engaged in addressing these problems. Okay. The reasons for the decline of civic education, um, the, the number of reasons as to why there is a defect, they, there's a lack of adequate uh, civic education. Uh, as Meda has said, it's, it's, a politi it's politically um, oriented, it's politically inclined, because uh, the more the masses do not understand the, the need for uh, good governance, need for making responsible, need to make responsible choices, the more, the more that they're problems with development, the problems with uh, social engagement, because it works better for governance, bad governance, to have to have a divide uh, and rule kind of setup. So uh, this is why the political dysfunction point is top on the list. And then we have polarized media. Um, this refers to um, a very big divide between like a very vast uh, difference between the opinions or um, let's say the attitudes of people like uh, mm -hmm. I think I'll step to her so okay. um, um, with the issue of um, political dysfunction um, basically political dysfunction is a situation whereby um, the government is more of like not able to conduct its duties. So um, as a government, we expect it to be for the people, by the people, but um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not run that way. It's literally um, decisions made by government and that's it. It's like we do not have engagement of the masses in any way. So when we come in and we call, talk about uh, political dysfunction, we are basically uh, talking about the bad governance and uh, it's necessary here that uh, people want, people will have opinions and even if they do have the opinions, the opinions will not be implemented in any way. So it's like you are, you are having your ideas out there, but then it's all to deaf ears. And then polarized media, polarized media is more of like into divergent opinions on situations. So um, basically, as Ricardo shared earlier on, in most cases, journalists uh, do report situations of interest. And also, it's up to a journalist to take up their side of opinion. So, um, which is quite interesting, but uh, it's something that is affecting civic education. So those who are trying to get into the system and learn how these things work, end up getting confused or biased, unless you do have a specific point of strategy that you'd want to settle for. Um, and then uh, we have another issue of civic deserts. Um, civic deserts refers to more of like few to no grounds to share opinions. Well, at least um, Lois, I, um, Ricardo, Grisha, Philo, and so many other people who have participated in this event are having an opportunity to share out their opinions and what they think. Otherwise, um, it's something to do with uh, 
you're promoting civic education, I would say. <laughs> so um, once such systems are shut down in, um, in countries or in society, you find that um, people fail to realize the problems that society is facing. And in most cases, I would say, even if they realize, they are quite ignorant towards them until they are awakened and made to realize how alarming the situation is. And this can only happen if we come into circles like this, where we are going to listen and share with each other about certain situations. Otherwise, um, <laughs> I would say in, um, in Africa, it's quite rare for youth to actively engage in such platforms. Yes, so the rate of civic education is quite lacking. And then um, decline in participation. I've already talked about this. Uh, in most cases, people are quite um, ignorant, stroke arrogant about certain situations. So um, for example, I would, Someone can look at, let's say, a strike, or um, in most cases, I'll use a strike. A strike as, as a cool event, a cool event. The person does not realize the uh, the need for let's talk of um, intervening to address a situation because it shows that something is not right and immediate action is required. Someone can anticipate a strike and be like, yeah, today my school is on strike because um, probably teachers have not gotten salary paid on time or um, certain decisions have been made in a really, um, <laughs> in a really biased manner. Or probably there's a form of oppression that a specific group has been going through and finally they're deciding to speak up. But to this person, it's an exciting event because they do not realize um, the need for action to be taken. And in this case, they need to understand the situation. But because civic education isn't part of our system, someone can never realize the need for this unless they have been able to be guided and made to understand the dynamics on how the things work. So um, this goes to the entire house. Why do we acknowledge the need for civic education in this case? We would like to um, ask someone to raise a hand and tell us why we should acknowledge the need for civic education at institute level. At least your idea could be presented somewhere and. Um, touch the heart of our higher political bodies to put it into our system. <laughs> Anyone? You can go through you can go through this presentation and then at the end of it maybe taking up questions. Okay, okay, okay. So um we'll go to the next slide. Okay. Um why do we acknowledge the need for civic education? First uh, is because fundamentals of government are understood. Um meaning that we understand what the purpose or, of a government is and why, why governments are in place in the first place. It's to address um, or to be in charge of what is, um, what is the citizen's uh, need, what is the citizen's um, requirement to exist in a, in, a, in a stable state or in a basically in a in a good uh, environment and um, ownership of citizens is a, is attained oh, this please. means um, this means that um citizens uh, get to own their, their um, to power to and their abilities uh, to bring change or to yeah there are uh, once the citizens are aware of what's uh, what is required like and the and the responsibilities on their shoulders they can able they can be able to take ownership of what is supposed to be done or, or what should be done and then proactive and knowledge voting um this this is very it's, it's very interesting in some african countries because uh, 
different country in different countries people vote for different reasons and not necessarily um, the right reasons like some in some countries people vote for uh, people who make them um, maybe who are who look like they are fun or something other countries like my own <laughs> I'm sorry to say people vote uh, based on who gives them the, mo the most amount of cash during the election period. So uh, that will not be considered wise because um, the, the why we vote is to make sure that leadership addresses concerns that citizens have. So once civic education is, is in place, uh, there will be more proactive uh, voting and people will vote from a point of knowledge and yeah limitations and a challenged government so um uh on on the on the limitations uh okay basically the the government will just uh the government will operate based on how how well or how aware as uh, citizens of that uh, that that it governs are so if the less aware people are then the more uh, the decisions are just delegated to us a, a, a minority group and the the not everyone's um, opinions or views will be incorporated into the decision making and then skill evolvement um, people will be able to like the skills will be in place to be able to make proper uh, what do you say proper uh, decisions and then proper engagements and and such kind of things. And then public issues understood, political engagement viewed and participation in civic activities. Um, this is, it's basically coming back to the same point, like once um, civic ed education is in place, um, we can understand why, how issues come by and how to solve them, what is the procedure like, and how well they can be addressed. Like, if the more the more public issues are understood by the um, pass at a personal and individual level, and if if that is enhanced um, of overall, most people or let's say the a lot of people will get uh, to engage and and understand from an under from a point of understanding and then there'll be effective that will all that will lead to effective collaboration amongst all necessary parties for change so um once uh, everyone gets to be on the same page there'll be um enough strength or like as they say, uh, teamwork makes the dream work. So uh, effective collaboration will, will, will be ensured and then will, sorry, will happen as a result of this uh, co co collective understanding and uh, engagement. And, and so um, if all the necessary parties are involved, uh, there will be change that will result as a, as a result of that um, collaboration. Unless, Major, you have something to add. Um, thank you so much, um, Lois. So um, basically, I'll just add on my voice to the point that talked about proactive and knowledge voting. Um, I think this is one of the major points in civic education. Um, people will, will not vote out of petty pleasing, but will rather choose to vote um, based on someone who is knowledgeable enough and will choose to bring change one way or another to the country. So um, 
I'll give an example of my country, and this is one of the reasons as to why we actually were pushing in for this. And probably next time while we are presenting this, it would be more entailed because we would have already had feedback from so many other African countries. So um, basically what happens is this. Um, in a country whereby citizens are not having civic education as part of their curriculum, well, these are expected to be um, the future leaders of tomorrow, right? So um, if you are going to um, have people going in for parliamentary seats and giving them ministries to handle, Ministry of Education, Ministry of, Envir of Environment, Ministry of uh, Industries and Fisheries, how are you going to endeavor that some of these laws are enacted or at least are implemented so um, the thing is, we won't have this happening because um, the person who has gone in there, first of all, does not understand their responsibilities as a leader. Second of all, does not feel the pain in so many other people who have, whose eyes have been opened and are speaking up on what they believe should be done. If we are keeping on talking to the government about issues to do with air pollution, I, for one, was in Nairobi um, before I came to Mexico. And I chatted with a friend and I told her, you know what? I feel sick because I developed a heavy chest because of the air quality. The air pollution is extremely bad. So um, to them, it's, it looks like the more the air quality is bad, the more industrialized your city is which is something that is going to be so toxic and I'm really afraid for um, the human species within Nairobi. Same thing with Kampala, Uganda, and I believe it's a major issue for so many um, other African countries. Why? People are, have not been educated on so much of this and uh, they are expected to lead us and uh, implement most of these rules which haven't been implemented, I won't lie. Um, the other thing is limitation of um, government. So um, with limitation of government, once a mass is educated and they do know what they want, trust me, they will do all it takes in order for them to attain or receive what they do deserve. Because um, they'll give <laughs> the ruling bodies sleepless nights. That's why they keep saying, we keep pointing fingers at government, but trust me, we the citizens have a major role to play as well. But once the citizens ain't empowered, you don't expect anything to, results to be yielded in any way. Yes. So um, the, other point, the other point that I would like to add my voice in is the issue of skill involvement. Once civic education is attained, um, 21st century skills like teamwork, perseverance, prob problem solving, recruitment, and um, so many others that are needed in order for one to strive and thrive in such a generation um, would be attained. But sadly, in Africa, all this is lagging behind amongst so many youth. We'd put it at 30% um, of youth obtaining these skills and the other 70 plus would put it probably at 70 to 74% are lagging behind because um, it has been cut out of the system. Um, yes, next point, please. Next slide. Okay, so um, you have understood the current situation. What are your recommendations as a member of society facing a setback in development due to lack of enhanced civic education? I would leave this to the audience. Um, if you've understood the current situation that we have presented to you, we are having so many issues to attain. We are dreaming of attaining the UN Sustainable Development Goals by 2030, but then how is this going to happen yet the masses ain't um, empowered? So um, what are your recommendations towards this situation? You're asking the audience? Yes, please. Okay. Are you through with the presentation? Um, we just have our summarized recommendation that we'd share. Okay, After we can take up questions at the end of it. I think it will be much more easier. Okay, okay, okay. Next slide, please. 
Okay, please. Okay. Um, the recommendations we had in place include uh, schools enabling young people to develop uh, and practice knowledge, beliefs, and behaviors needed to participate in civil, uh, sorry, civic life for a better change. Um, if if civic education were addressed at uh, at school level, like it's much more easier for it to become a norm. Like we all know that schools are the bedding grounds for knowledge, and if knowledge uh, civic education knowledge is included, uh, sorry, civic education is included as part of the curriculum that would help a lot to uh, uh, develop skills at a young age and not only develop the skills, the, the children who learn this will grow uh, understanding the need for civic education in their life and in their communities. And so that will affect change with time, at least even if not immediate or instantly, but with time, the, the required change will be uh, re, 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 uh, achieved. NGOs and government should invest efforts in ensuring that civic education is part and parcel of the learning system for the younger generation to uh, raise great and well-equipped leaders. This comes back to the point of um, investing in young people and making sure they understand what, how, how important it is for them to be knowledgeable about um, what the 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 ed, like what would help effect change in their communities, what will help um, reach their goals generally. As Meda has talked about, uh, we, we're talking about goals, but there is no uh, framework in place to ensure that the goals are attained. So we need to, the government and NGOs need to incorporate efforts and and not just effort, consistent effort to make sure that civic education is part and parcel uh, of the learning system. Then the final point, point is that parents should train, raise and equip their children with civic life dynamics that will benefit them as individuals and society as well. Um, they say charity begins at home. so. It will be very, um, uh, as, as much as schools and government uh, should work on civic uh, education, parents should also be a very uh, major driving force in the whole civic um, education um, program, or let's say in the whole system, so that. Uh, whatever is being taught in school is emphasized at home. And so children grow up uh, knowing that this is not just school uh, work, it's, it's, it's a whole, it's a whole all round approach. Like it, it's a whole, all, it's a, it's a, it's a whole, let's say, um, each, it's it's a whole requirement for life. Like it's not just something they learn in school, you know. It's, and it's not some something that just the government uh, has put in place. It's something that will help their lives to progress in the required manner. So that's that's all. We, uh, unless Mida, you have something to add. I would I would say I really don't have anything much to really add because the recommendations are being thoroughly uh, paraphrased. But um, what I could say is um, parents do have a major role play in this, even if we put it on schools or something like that, especially in African society and probably any other third world country whereby uh, formal education came in at a later stage. I do believe that the current generation of parents is an educated group of uh, people okay, to a greater extent, and they do understand 
that uh, the dynamics of society. So if they could make children raise up in a way that would be more beneficial, not just to themselves, but more impactful to others as well, that would do a major role play in attaining community development and addressing so many issues that are faced in society. Okay, so um, to some- Can, you, can up, you go back to the previous slide just for one second? Oh, okay. The recommendation one. Okay, go on please. Okay. Um, so um, to sum this all up, we had a simple quote, which is um, an, an exam. Okay, you know how we always say um, ignorance is bliss? <laughs> Today we come up and challenge you that um, an unexamined life is not worth living. So this is by Socrates. Um, Thank you so much for your time. And um, it was really nice sharing this with you. Okay, I'm sure that the audience must have some questions. I got some questions based on your last two slides. Can I ask? Yes, please, sir. First of all, uh, you said the last one, there's a quote from Socrates, unexamined life is? Pardon? The last slide that you had, you had a quote, quotation from Socrates that unexamined life is? Um, unexam unexamined life is not worth living. Okay. You know what? The problem is that our lives are being examined by everybody else except our own selves. So <laughs> it's like uh, we have been, that has been the pivotal discussion uh, since the crash went this morning. Uh, o'clock at uh, midday time so that's the problem with that uh, we are not able to examine our own lives our own lifestyle what we are supposed to be doing so just randomly running on a street loose and without any direction so far and the few questions that popped up on the based on the second the last second slide that we had you had three recommendations they look very easy very simple but they're the most difficult in current times First one was around the school should enable children and whatever. So that you are, uh, you are putting the responsibility on the schools that they should be enabling their children and those under their custody for educating them in the right direction, isn't it? Briefly. Second was uh, the role of civic society and NGOs in trying to choose the person who leads that particular department running that uh, portfolio in that country, isn't it? For, for instance, if there's an education minister, they should be a compatible person to run the education department. That was through your presentation also, isn't it? Yes. And third one was the parents should be raising their kids in a way that they should be accountable to their own sex and the society. That basically is the summary of your recommendation. The three last recommendations are the most difficult in current times, I said. You know, there is a quotation. It says youth is, uh, youth is wasted on the young. It's a phrase that, that, that's quoted because uh, maybe when they are young and when they have a lot of energy, they're not able to channelize it in the proper direction. But there's a new dimension added to that. We say wisdom is wasted on the youth. Sorry, wisdom is wasted on the old. And the reason is that by the time we are into our age, we have got a lot, gathered a lot of wisdom, which is no use to us because we have already been past that stage. We can't use it for ourselves. Our experience can only be used by the young who do not listen to us in the first place. So, so it says that youth is wasted on the young. I say wisdom is wasted on the old. The problem is that we are not synchronized with our requirements of the society, our own needs and where we are headed towards. For instance, the school are entrusted with the responsibility of raising the kids in a uh, correct educational manner. But the problem is that the kids, they have no control. The government dictates the policies, the education policies, and that is literally dashed down to the students. The teachers have literally no role or not much role uh, left to them to nourish the children the way they did before, maybe two generations back or three generations back. Similarly, it goes for parents also. Parents have, and it's across the world, it's not only India, developing countries, in the developed countries also. They literally lost their parenting role. There's so much a difference already 
being generated, the generation gap being generated. It was always there, but now it is very, very difficult even to talk to any teenager. Nine out of 10 are not in sync with their parents at all. They think they are old, they are gone, they are useless, their wisdom is wasted completely. And third was uh, about the NGOs directing the government. You know, uh, we had a describe to when uh, Dr. Ash was here. He say politicians are people who, given a topic, immediately decide to speak and they can go on for hours and hours without understanding the topic, without being concerned with the topic, but they can talk on. On the other hand, diplomats are people who know they, they are given a topic, they understand the topic, but they think for hours and hours and hours and decide not to say anything. So we have two kinds of people, the politicians who do not know anything, do not want to do anything, but they can speak on. And the diplomats who can understand, who can guide it, but they don't decide not to do anything. And in between is just the civic society, which is the crux of your presentation altogether. Now, this is a very difficult job for civic society to try to force the governments to come out with better policies with the right people and to force the government to head in the right direction. And possibly that is the challenge that you guys are trying to focus on and bringing forth so nicely. So thank you, Medaho, for your presentation. It was very, very educative and it has a new angle to the entire conversation we have had in the last 18 hours. And thank you very much. Any of the audience wants to put up a question to Meda or her friend Louis. Nahid is waiting for her presentation also. Any questions from any students, any audience? Shall I want to ask something? Yeah. Yes, sir, I have a question. So my question for you is, in your opinion, what are the most effective methods of nature protection and biodiversity currently? Okay, um, thank you so much, Shadra. Um, so um, from what I have been doing, um, I think the most effective way of nature protection and bi biodiversity, one, um, is to make, uh, make the masses so much aware of the effects that climate change is um, having on the environment lately. Um, so in this case, uh, the pop movement has tried to, is actually, it hasn't tried to a greater extent. It has put out information to, um, for people to access so as to understand the current situation on um, the urgent need to protect the biodiversity. So as you said, um, once someone is made aware about something, it's, the ball is now in their hands to decide on what to do with this. So the major thing is how the information is delivered and um, to whom it's being delivered to. So if you make the situation real, uh, if you make uh, people realize the urgency to protect biodiversity, then um, that's uh, one of the major steps to um, protect it. I think that's the major. Um, Thank you. Ma. Anyone else? Um, I think there's another question. So one year, Sharma. I think she raised her hands. Yeah. Um, just, just a minute. Oh. Just a minute. Yes, Vanya, you can ask. Uh, so, ma'am, the question from my side is to you is that what is the main uh, like thing that we, the small children, children can do to prevent global warming? Um, so, small children. Um, first, um, the first thing that, thank you so much for that nice question, um, Vanya. Um, that shows how much... Um, you do realize the current situation and the effect that global warming is having on society currently. So um, we, we do realize that, um, the, what country are you from? India, right? Uh, yes. Yes, yes. So um, basically, um, you would more of like, the major step that I would recommend you to take is um, protect the vegetation that you do have in your country. Um, make people realize um, the urgency and 
need for them to conserve that nature that you're having because um, once you cut down those trees, um, you're giving room for most of um, the gases that are increasing on the rate of global warming, in this case, carbon monoxide and all that to accumulate within the atmosphere. And so um, you're prone to most of the things. And also um, basically make people realize, uh, um, reduce on the rate at which they do activities that um, release um, most of the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Um, you can start with simple things like eating meat. I really, I trust that you don't eat meat. So um, um, basically those small, small things. Um, the rate at delete your emails, uh, the, the useless emails that you have, and also um, encourage your other friends to make sure that they delete useless information that they do have within their search engines. These small, small acts at least can reduce carbon uh, monoxide rates in the atmosphere little by little. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Thank you, Mida. I think Rajiv, I, I just wanted Rajiv, I just wanted to tell everyone because uh, we yeah, see sure. different organizations working together. So uh, recently, I talked to Rajiv, and he has an idea of starting Act Now Club. And uh, the, what we found that there are a lot of different organizations that work, and they're not actually uh, together in a one platform. So we will do like drops of water, but is the action is not coming for everyone is scattered around. So Raju got a great idea that why can't we put all this organization under one, we can help every students to work for any other organization with the Act Now Club idea. And I do really appreciate that idea because uh, sometimes the egos of working across these organizations because they always think my organization is better than the other, and networking is still not there. And you know, even we talk about it, we just want our own picture and a frame and to call ourselves a you know, man gods. Okay. So I really like uh, Rajiv's idea of starting the Act Now Club. Uh, so that will be a platform. We we will work across the board. We'll be working with all the organization and uh, we will just give the students a platform so they can actually interact with other organizations around the world. Uh, so thanks to Rajiv for coming up with this great idea. And he also want to link all these two SDG goals. So please join with the Act Now Club. And uh, you can find the information in the Act Now uh, website. Uh, so thanks to Rajiv coming with an idea and also JK uh, for uh, building up this whole team. I appreciate it a lot. Uh, so Rajiv, uh, thanks a lot. Thank you, Rani. Thank you so much. And, uh, of course, we have so many young youth pop mentors and we have had a whole stream of battery from all across the world, uh, last one being Meta Hope. And we want to connect uh, their beautiful thoughts to young students we have in this program. So we'll be working together in future to connect them together so we bring different ideas. Because in a school, you know, there are a lot of students. They are 500 students, they have 500 different minds. They might want to go in five different directions. So we want to... Uh, expose them to these different opportunities, different thoughts, and we have experts who can guide them. Like Veda can guide them through on what expertise she has. Nahid can guide students to what expertise she has. And with together, we have so much of variety of expertise, one common thinking and one common goal, that is to protect our planet, isn't it? Thank you, Rani. Uh, Nahid is waiting for a long time. Nahid, I'm so sorry that I've kept you waiting and I'm adding a spotlight to you. Okay, she is, uh, she is a sweet youth mentor for POP and uh, uh, she loves to organize events also. And the last event we had attended, she was uh, hosting it. So it's my turn to host you. Nahid, you have a presentation to make. The platform is over to you. Thank you. Okay, so I'll start sharing my screen. Would you? Uh, I, I do not have access. I can... Just uh, to read. Yeah. That's a beautiful have... painting in the background. Can you show us? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And this is also related with something yes. ecological. Yes. This, is, this is a painting. Oh, we have only one earth. You got two earth over there. So, you know, uh, 
know, like it's Mother Earth, you know, it's the Earth, you know, it's uh, an eye that symbolizes how, you know, she's watching for all of us. Uh, and on the other side, you know, um, you can see like um, how, you know, it's a cycle, you know, that it starts forming new life and um, the way that we should protect it, like nature protect us. Okay, that's what I thought Mother Earth is holding another Earth. So this, she is hiding one more Earth for us. <laughs> okay. Now you oh. okay. Oh. Oh. Thank you. I will start sharing my slides. First, introduce yourself to the younger audience. Okay, so first, hi everyone. My name is Naki Perez. I'm from Mexico and I'm a pop youth mentor at the Protector Planet Movement. I'm an 18 year old and I'm a senior in high school. So I'm very excited to be with you all. So uh, I'm gonna be talking to you very briefly about education and the youth in the climate movement. So I wanted to start, you know, asking, like asking all of you, is human being the object of education or just giving skills to function in a given world? Uh, why, you know, uh, a very renewed um, phrase that we have in the climate movement is, if the climate is changing, why aren't we? So if the climate is changing and society is changing, why education still the same? You know, when we have uh, different necessities that older generations have, you know, uh, we live in a different world. So, you know, we should start uh, giving our kids new skills, forming new skills and, you know, uh, for them actually giving them like a platform, not just uh, like the same system for everyone. Because I believe that we need a comprehensive quality and value-based, you know, uh, relevant, influential and innovative education that forms citizens that are capable of performing successfully in the new knowledge society and that are committed to the sustainable development of the entity. So what does that mean? Why do we need to have the same, you know, system, the same education system for everyone when we all have different uh, ways to learn, right? So you cannot treat me the same as you can treat other child because we have different ways of learning. So you cannot uh, tell me that I'm a bad student or not being able to learn as the other student is learning. Uh, I believe that it's very important also, for example, um, in high school, I have the privilege of, you know, being in high school and my school has, you know, for the seniors, like different classes. So you can choose, you know, in which kind of like group you want to be in. So if you like more mathematics and you want to go, for example, for college, you want to go for a finance career, you might go, you know, for a different um, kind of studies that the ones that I'll be studying, you know, I'm in a... Um, health and science part of classes. So I, you know, try to not take, uh, for example, mathematics as they are not my strong, but, you know, other, other youth might be more interested in physics that they might be in biology. So I think that's a very good uh, way of, you know, getting to know ourselves a little bit more in what we want to do. Um, I wanted to show you this slide, you know, as getting back to the to the phrase that I was telling you, of if the climate's changing, why aren't we? So we know that uh, young people have pushed the uh, climate change movement to the forefront at a global discourse through these strikes, right? Uh, we have seen strikes that are impossible to ignore, that are at magnitudes that we are, you know, that are really uh, impossible to imagine. Uh, one of these strikes more because that we have seen was at COP26, you know, there were lots of, you know, people in the whole city and that was amazing. Because, you know, they're, they're, they're letting us know that why are, um, like they're highlighting that politicians, for example, are making all the policies that are going to be affecting us. And we are, you know, uh, being outside, waiting for them to take actions that are gonna, you know, affect us. So that's the important that uh, I wanted to let you know on youth um, in the climate movement. Uh, 
My experience in the club and movement begin with uh, the pop movement. So I'm very grateful because uh, they have taught me a lot because we believe, you know, on youth inspired by knowledge, as you all know. So that's why I link, you know, education and um, the youth because we cannot uh, try to fight or try to talk about something if we do not know the base of the problem. If I do not know what it's climate change, if I do not know uh, how climate change affects me, I cannot fight, I cannot uh, try to talk about climate change because I do not know what it's climate change. So first I have to educate myself, I had to educate the others so they can understand and they can, be, uh, they can begin, you know, to start feeling what's this movement about and what do they have to fight? Why do they have uh, to take actions to protect our earth? So we know that uh, we cannot do like the same things that maybe we, uh, that maybe we did uh, or that our parents did or that our grandparents did because the things are changing. So we want to have a future, but they're not letting us have a future. Because as you saw on my last slide, this is a very impactful uh, phrase that it's you'll die of old age, I'll die of climate change. That I, I really believe that's a very impactful phrase. Because uh, we as youth, you know, have a lot of responsibility in our hands, yes. But also we have a lot of opportunities. We still have an act, uh, a window to take action and I think that older generations have given us that amazing window of taking actions. And they have been with us, you know, they have taken us. So um, that's why I believe on the importance of education and that you're stepping up to um, take uh, these kind of actions. So I wanted to let you know about uh, this phrase that it's uh, Sia Bastida, it's a climate activist. And she says that whatever you do, you have to make sure to hold the hand of someone that is older and hold the sun and hold the hand of someone that is younger than you in whatever you do. So we are talking right now about taking action, but the perspective that I have, it's not the perspective that uh, someone younger than me might have. And it's not the perspective that someone older than me might have. So there's, you know, a beautiful uh, connection on learning more, uh, learning more about perspectives, that your opinion is not the only opinion. And if you get to know others' perspectives, it's gonna be you know, a huge window of action. So I wanted to really share this phrase of always make sure to, hand, uh, to hold the hand of someone older and hold the hand of someone younger. Because I believe that uh, I've, I've uh, heard some people speak, some youth speak, that you know are really saying that how older and older generations um, gave us the problem, how you know everything it's like uh, the fault of older generations. But I want to hear more about how older generations are supporting us and are letting us you know learn. Because uh, for example, the opportunities that I have had of learning are not the same opportunities that other generations have had. So I believe that we should, you know, take the resources and the privileges that we have and share those kind of like uh, privileges and resources that we have. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more, but I saw that most of my mates have talked about the points that I wanted to talk. So, uh, you know, I, I just really have uh, for the audience, um, Mentimeter, if they would like to, to join, you know, this is the QR code. If you're not available to scan it, uh, I'll just give you, you know, the the number in which you can enter the, the QR code. I'm gonna share this. Uh, can you see the other slide that I'm sharing? The Mentimeter slide. I was trying for uh, your QR code. Can I see once again? Yeah, yeah, of course. Menti. Yes. Thank yes. you. Yeah, you can change slide now. Okay, thank you. I'm 
I'm gonna present the slide. Uh, if you're not able to scan, if you were not able to scan the QR code, uh, do let me know and you know, you can just uh, type the code. You can see the, the link here. I'm also gonna post it on the chat. So, you know, as, as you can see, this is a question for the audience and it's how can you be engaged in the climate movement? Do remember that you can be engaged in the climate movement in many, many ways. Um, for example, I, I started at the pop movement at 16. I have to, you know, this year I had to choose the career that I was going to. I was really, really bored. So I was always talking with my mentors about the career that I wanted to be in. I always knew that I always wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to go to medical school. I started on the climate movement and I was like, do I really have the time? You know, should I really go to medical school if I'm seeing, you know, how, um, how much action is needed in the climate movement? So they, they uh, a, a person, you know, uh, it was uh, Dr. Richard Dasher in one of our, you know, uh, conference at the pop movement. He said that, and, and this is very important, uh, mostly for all of you that it's hearing right now, that every career is a climate career. So you have a million ways to like link every action that you do, everything that you do to protect the environment. And if you cannot do that, uh, at least you can do it to reduce, for example, your carbon footprint or, okay, how can you mean? Okay, yeah, those are very good. Uh, answers. I'm going to wait for more. Um, as I was saying, you know, you can, you, you have like a million options of action in everything that you do in your daily lives. So do remember that every of your actions right now have consequences and mostly have consequences for the environment. So, you know, uh, we have to be a little bit more responsible in that way. Uh, that's also how education come, come, comes in the front of us because we should be uh, leading by example, right? So for example, I go for a run or, and I can go for a run, you know, in my block or two blocks away from my house. And if I'm seeing, you know, that there's garbage in the street, I start to picking it up, to picking it up and to picking it up or I go next to a park, you know, and there's garbage in there. Or uh, for example, people that go in for walks with their dogs. I think that we have all seen, you know, people going uh, for walks with the dogs and they, um, you know, the dog, you know, poops and the owner just uh, lets that poop, you know, in there. So one action that we can do if we see this, uh, it's, you know, first you can go to the person and say like, hey, would you mind, you know, picking it up? Second, uh, they do not do that, or you do not want to go, you know, to a stranger and ask them to pick up uh, their dog's poop. You can, you can do it. So, you know, uh, these are very like silly uh, examples, but that's a way I, I really wanted to tell you that because I've seen a very uh, different way that my blog, for example, started conducting itself. So they saw me, you know, picking, you know, the trash on the street. So they were like, why are you picking this trash, like the trash of the, street, like, of, the, of the street when you're always coming, you know, for a run? And I tell them like, why not? Like, why not? Why should I let, you know, just the trash in there? So it's been a really good, because I've seen, you know, more people going for the runs with a trash bag and picking up, you know, uh, trash that is in the street. And we, and that has prevented uh, my city for more, um, Floods, because my city is a city that uh, if we are, if we have not if we are not in a drought we are in a flood. So uh, at least those kind of actions and everyday actions have have had a positive impact. Um, is anyone else having a little bit of trouble with the Mentimeter? Because we still just have those two answers. If you cannot access the Mentimeter, you can just open your mic. And you know, let us know how can you be engaged in the climate movement. Uh, just want to make sure to everyone, I'm sharing all the work in a Padlet. You can also add your feedback. So I just share her Mentimeter on the Padlet. The password is at now. 
So you guys can share your activities and your inquiries to her or anyone, please share there. Uh, what if you are busy, you can present everything. You can also post it there so everyone else can look at it here, there. The password is act now. Everything is in a capital letter. I also share her uh, Mintimeter there too, okay? So please feel free to, you know, help her. And this is awareness. Everyone can, you know, uh, get the platform and help, okay, to know each other. Thanks a lot. So, uh, ma'am, my question for you is that, uh, like, it, I have a switch situation. Like uh, we ask uh, people to save trees and protect trees and do not cut trees, but ourselves not uh, never tried it. We always like say people to save our nature, clean our nature, but we are not like we are ourselves not doing that. So is it right from your side or not? That's, that's a very good question because I think that's something that we all do. You know, um, we think that we might have the authority or the education to start educating people and start saying, like, do not do that, do not do that, do not do that. What are we doing it? Are we leading by example? Is that, you know, like a moral thing to say, right? I really like your question. Um, so... I think that, you know, we, we should keep uh, trying, to, trying to educate other people, but at the same time, educate ourselves. So you should keep trying, you know, you should keep saying, do not harm the trees, uh, protect our trees. But at the same time, you should do it as well. But maybe, you know, you're not doing it, but at the at the, you know, you might have said that phrase to 10 people. And from those 10 people, two of them started, you know, uh, having a change in their lives. So I do think it was worth it, even though you're not doing it. Because those two people, you know, you took like a chip into their mentality, you know, um, you switch, you know, like the buttons in their mentality, and they started, you know, having that change that you wanted to do, you have not been able to do whatever you're not, whatever reason you're not doing it, but they started doing it. So I think that's, that's the important part. But, you know, again, I think that we all learn best if the people that are, you know, guiding us, guiding us, you know, saying it like that, are leading us by example. So uh, thank you for your question. Thank you, ma'am, for answering my question. You're welcome. I uh, just want to uh, know, ask all of your help. Please fill up the MNT meter. And also, that will be helpful for, for her uh, to know your opinion, okay? So it would be really cool to interact uh, with her. So if you can fill up uh, the one or two words uh, about how you can spread the awareness, it would be great for her to, to know and uh, uh, help you too, okay? Thanks a lot. Yeah, and do remember, you know, that it does not have to be like a very specific answer you know you can you can really set uh, an action that you can do in your daily life you can set how you can involve your school or uh how can you involve you know whatever you do in the afternoon how can you link for example um the sport that you do you know to protect the environment there is a lot of things that you can do so do thing do have a little more um space to think on that question and do answer our team third place. We would love to know. Okay. More. Thank you, Nahid. Thank you so much. We have our next speakers all lined up and waiting over there. Thank you so much. It's a beautiful presentation and we're going to uh, connect with you. Uh, we are connected, but we're going to have more interaction with you, especially with the younger ones. Somebody called you ma'am, so I just need to tell them you're as young as they are. So <laughs> it's just fine. So, thank you so much. Yeah. After this, uh, we'll be playing a video from UNDP, United Nations Development Project. It's a beautiful project they run in Himalaya. It's called Secure mm -hmm. Himalayas. So last time uh, they had shared with us what they're doing for the snow leopard. And this time they have built up a nice waste management technique. You know, it's a huge challenge in the mountains. India has uh, some of the world's largest mountains and they are very difficult, all the stories and the climbers, the trekkers and the people who live around there, they throw lots of rubbish and they have uh, tied up with the government of Uttarakhand, which is the home state, and they have built this beautiful waste management technology. So this 
future has been contributed. Ma'am is busy in the field, so she couldn't join directly. This is from United Nations Development Project. So that video will show. Then we have uh, our Taiwanese friends for a quick, quick presentation. Then we have Francis from South Sudan. is interesting country, an interesting person. Then we have presentations from Guatemala, another young climate activist who worked with me when she was very young. She was uh, a youth leader in uh, Planet uh, Plan for the Planet also. Now she runs her own organization. Then Ivan is also waiting on the Challenge 2020. So we have whole host of uh, battery of hosts and speakers lined up from interesting countries on interesting topics. So can I request uh, JK sir to play this video track uh, uh, B32 and then we can move on. 42. Yes, 32, 32. वर्तमान समय में ठोस अपशिष्ट प्रबंधन देश के प्रत्येक क्षेत्र में एक गंभीर समस्या बन चुका है हिमालय राज्यों में ठोस कचरे का निस्तारण ठीक से न हो पाने के कारण हिमालय की संवेदनशील इकोलॉजी और यहाँ की बहुमूल्य वनस्पतियों एवं वन्य जीवों पर दिख रहे दुष्प्रभाव आने वाले बड़े खतरे की ओर संकेत कर रहे हैं विशेषज्ञों के अनुसार डिब्बा बंद या प्रसंस्कृत खाद्य पदार्थों जैसे बिस्किट चिप्स आदि में मौजूद नमक की मात्रा जानवरों को कचरे की ओर अधिक आकर्षित करती है जिस कारण कचरे में मौजूद इन उत्पादों के रैपर की ओर आकर्षित होकर जानवर पॉलिथीन और प्लास्टिक के सेवन को प्रवृत्त हो जाते हैं इस गंभीर समस्या के निदान के लिए सिक्योर हिमालय परियोजना द्वारा उत्तर काशी जनपद में स्थित गोविंद वन्य जीव विहार ऐसी शुरुआत कर हिमालय क्षेत्र में ठोस अपशिष्ट प्रबंधन करने की पहल की गयी है सिक्योर हिमालय प्रोजेक्ट जो कि जनपद उत्तरकाशी में अभी क्रियान्वित किया जा रहा है उसी क्रम में हमारे गोविंद पशु विहार के मोरी ब्लॉक के बहुत ही सुदूर विलेजेस में वेस्ट मैनेजमेंट पर बहुत ही प्रशंसनीय कार्य किया जा रहा है जिसमें गांव में जो टूरिस्ट ट्रैकर्स या जो गांव का वेस्ट है उसको कैसे कलेक्ट करना है सेग्रीग्रेट करना है और कैसे उसको साइंटिफिकली डिस्पोज करना है इसमें लोगों को ट्रेन किया जा रहा है और सशक्त किया जा रहा है सेग्रीगेशन शेड्स बनाए जा रहे हैं मेटीरियल रिकवरी फैसिलिटी का क्रियान्वयन किया जा रहा है और वहाँ पर जो हमारे सी एस पार्टनर्स हो सकते हैं उनके साथ कोलैबोरेट करके इसको और एक्सटेंसिव रूप देने का जो इनका प्लान है आगे और विलेजेस को जोड़ने का इससे निश्चित तौर पे एक रिस्पॉन्सिबल टूरिज्म रिस्पॉन्सिबल एडवेंचर टूरिज्म और जो लोग वहाँ पे आ रहे हैं उसको अप्रिशिएट करेंगे और कहीं ना कहीं हमारा जो एक बायोलॉजिकल हैबिटेट है जिसका हमारा प्राइम जो स्नो लेपर्ड है उसके कंजर्वेशन के लिए भी हमें बल मिलेगा गोविंद पशु विहार या राष्ट्रीय उद्यान को सन उन्नीस में एक वन्य जीव अभ्यारण्य के रूप में स्थापित किया गया था इस क्षेत्र में विभिन्न समुदाय के लोग निवास करते आ रहे हैं वर्तमान समय में लगभग बयालीस गांव इस संरक्षित क्षेत्र के अंतर्गत बसे हुए हैं ठोस अपशिष्ट प्रबंधन के प्रथम चरण में इन बयालीस गांवों में से दो गांव दोणी और सट्टा चुने गए सिक्योर हिमालय प्रोजेक्ट जो है ये हमारे जो एल्पाइन फॉरेस्ट है और एल्पाइन फॉरेस्ट की जो की स्पीसीज है हमारी स्नो लेपर्ड इसके कंजर्वेशन ऐसी रिलेटेड है इसके कंजर्वेशन के साथ साथ जो हमारे सराउंडिंग में जितने गांव वाले हैं उनके लिए जो अल्टरनेट सोर्स ऑफ इकोनॉमी का हो या उनकी जो आय के अलग संसाधन का हो उसके बारे में भी इस प्रोजेक्ट में हम लोग काम करते हैं स्थानीय लोग ठोस अपशिष्ट प्रबंधन के विषय में कितने जागरूक हैं ये जानने के लिए हमने क्षेत्र के कुछ लोगों से बातचीत की पहले तो कचरे को हम जैसे प्लास्टिक हो गए घर के बाहर जो घास भूस होते हैं वो हम खड में फेंकते हैं या फिर जला देते हैं अब हमें घर में बैग मिल रखे और हमें इकट्ठा करके बैग में डालते हैं सिक्योर हिमालय वालों ने हमें बैग दे रखे हम उन बैगों में पैक करते ताकि हमारे गाँव में आजकल गाँव में काफी सफाई हो रखी है मतलब प्लास्टिक बहुत ही कम दिखने लग गए आजकल परियोजना के अंतर्गत प्रारंभिक प्रयासों में सबसे पहले समुदाय को इस विषय के प्रति जागरूक किया गया इसके पश्चात डोर टू डोर अपशिष्ट संग्रहण एवं पृथककरण के लिए गांव के कुछ लोगों को चुनकर प्रशिक्षित किया गया जो सफाई साथी के रूप में कार्य कर रहे हैं और इस कार्य के लिए उन्हें मासिक आमदनी भी प्राप्त हो रही है जो लोगों ने कूड़ा को बड़ा कट कर रखो होता है उसको लाता हूँ और अपने कटे में डालता हूँ और यहाँ जो है कूड़े केंद्र में ले आता हूँ एज ए कम्युनिटी मोबिलाईजर मेरा काम है कि लोगों में मैं जागरूकता फैलाऊं और जो मेरे साथ मैं सफाई साथी काम करते हैं वो लोग जो है 
हफ्ते में जितना भी वेस्ट कलेक्ट करते हैं मैं उसकी डिटेल तैयार करता हूँ सफाई साथियों के सहयोग से स्थानीय लोगों के कौशल प्रशिक्षण पर भी निरंतर रूप से कार्य किया जा रहा है ग्रामीणों को खाद बनाने की तकनीक भी सिखाई जा रही है साथ ही गोविंद वन्य जीव विहार के सभी गाँव के मुख्य संपर्क स्थल नटवार में मटेरियल रिकवरी फैसिलिटी केंद्र स्थापित करने के लिए प्रशासन के साथ मिलकर प्रयास किए जा रहे हैं इस केंद्र के पास अपशिष्ट को पृथक करने संकुचित करने और निकटतम पुनर्चक्रण केंद्र तक भेजे जाने की व्यवस्था होगी जिससे स्थानीय लोगों को आजीविका संवर्धन का एक और अवसर प्राप्त होगा पुनर्चक्रण योग्य अपशिष्ट को पुरोला में स्थित निकटतम एग्रीगेटर से भी जोड़ा जा रहा है अपशिष्ट की प्रत्येक श्रेणी का एक भिन्न विक्रय मूल्य है जो एकत्रित उपयोगकर्ता शुल्क के साथ साथ अतिरिक्त आय का साधन है पिछले माह दोनों गांवों द्वारा सूखे कचरे गीले कचरे और शुद्ध प्लास्टिक की पृथककरण विधि को प्रति मास एक न्यूनतम शुल्क पर अपना लिया गया है अब तक लगभग पाँच किलो कूड़ा एकत्रित एवं पृथककृत करके दोनी और सट्टा के अपशिष्ट संग्रहण केंद्र में संग्रहित किया जा चुका है इस कार्य को भविष्य में अन्य गाँव में भी प्रारम्भ करने की योजना है सिक्योर हिमालय परियोजना का उद्देश्य इन गांवों में परिवर्तन लाकर सामुदायिक सफलता की ऐसी कहानी बनाना है जिससे ये ग्रामवासी उत्तराखंड के अन्य गांवों के लिए एक आदर्श उदाहरण बनकर सामने आए benefit of the global audience this is a entire mechanism has been built to collect solid waste in the mountains we, we know we are talking about enabling people so this is exactly the kind of thing that should be done it has enabled the villagers the local community over there not only to get rid of the waste but entire mechanism has been built so all this waste that is thrown across the villages and the mountain side its villagers can collect them Uh, the UNDP, along with the government of Uttarakhand, the local state, they have given them big bags to collect it, and they can collect this garbage and sell it, take it to the waste collection center where they get money out of it. So there is economic concern also at addressed, and after this waste is collected, there is a plant that recycles, segregates, and recycles. So the people involved they are also making a little bit of money who are villagers. so you know this incentive little bit of incentive is helping uh, this entire place the mountainous regions to clean itself and now they are discouraging tourist to throw garbage also there it's not that they get more money out of collecting garbage so wherever you want things to happen we must keep in mind that we have to enable people in order to be able to do it otherwise the policies and those implementing tools are going to fail and that was also the crux of discussion during the entire 12 hour Uh, that we had today i i was joined by the ceo of arunot which is penis forestry management company they have the huge technology to map forest and uh, uh, do wood logging but on a very sustainable level so i just asked him question what what the company can do about ngos and smaller people like us who don't have resources but we have motivation to do it and you know they don't have an answer they can only be the government and the big corporation and that is exactly the problem unless something becomes an economic proposition no climate action can take place and that bridge has to be gapped by the ngos and the people like us we need to bring it down to the local level for the people like us for the climate activists and the youth so unless local communities are involved person on the ground is involved no change can take place and that is why all the efforts of unep the united nations and the governments are not coming to fructify their pace is very slow and we know that we don't have time We have only ten or twenty-two decades left. Otherwise, we are doomed. We have to look for another planet. I'll be looking at the painting. I won't be looking at the planet Earth. Uh, Thank Raju, you, Nayak, so much. Yeah, Raju, yeah. I just want to get you in uh, because, uh, as you said, if there is a benefit, people work. Recently, I had a lot of 
uh, information from my friends that there's a village in Northeast India because they were named like a best uh, clean village for two times uh, by the government. And they make it as a tourist attraction. So, and they, he told me there's nothing exactly, just a clean village. But people are going there to see the clean village. So I got the information from it. Why can't the government push it forward to make it a big news? So then every other village wants to be the clean village. So they get the economic benefit. And I was like, that's a great idea because the, the, he told me a lot of people just go there in that Northeast place. I, I Unfortunately, I forgot the name. Uh, so he said, they just go there. And uh, you need to pay the money to get into the village. And they put all these shops there so the village people can make the money. And you need to walk. You need to park one place and walk. And he told me it's a great one. It's a great an idea. But the only thing he said, why can't the government push it, make it like a, a mainstream thing, you know, forward it. So next, the other villages also can go for it. Because when their villages know that there is a money, there's incentives, they can get it and they get proud of where, uh, like I would be proud of, you know, yesterday when he was uh, talking about uh, Kuchi, the, you know, airport with a, you know, world's first airport with a solar panel. Actually, I was proud because the place I'm coming from and I say, we are proud if Kuchi can make the airport full of, you uh, know, solar panel, everyone can make it, you know. So it's the way of, putting forward the awareness. And I think if there's incentives, other people work it. And this is making priority that what we are doing, making this as a priority, and then it would make a change. But Rani, I, your point well taken, but you know, that is what we have been discussing. The problem is the priorities of the government. The government across the world, their priorities are not what we are speaking about. They want to highlight, the government thought is highlight, want to highlight their actions. That's why they do it. The yeah. moment this project is successful because UNDP is involved with the local NGO over there and they're pushing the government to do it. The other danger is that if the money person gets involved also, tomorrow the villagers will be asking the tourists to throw more garbage so they can collect more. So <laughs> there are dangers also lurking over there. What we are trying to say that they are nice idea, but the problem is at the implementation level and we will depend on the government and the government alone and the big corporations. It will not happen because they can only work the corporation will work where there is an economic advantage. The government will work only there is a voting advantage. They get votes from. Civic society, on the other hand, doesn't look for advantage. They look for ground real work. So that is what we are trying to figure out how to how to bridge this gap between the civic society, the government, and the corporation. So real things can happen on the ground level. And the doers are not the government, it's the people over there. Yeah. They just somebody needs to be there to monitor, implement, bring ideas and see it through rather than living it in the uh, background. And this is the status in all developing countries, including developed countries. Talk about developed countries, talk about US, the, talk about Europe. Uh, yeah, yeah, Rajiv, you're yeah, right. Uh, yeah, actually, sorry, because I'm from India and I came to stay in Taiwan. I knew the reason is that people, we are not vibrant. Like when I was in India, I knew when we have a decentralized project, we didn't have enough people to get into those committees. So they were looking for people to be there because then the rule is you can be only in three committee maximum. So you ask people to be part of the committee because they don't want to get out of their comfort zone because they think, do I get paid? No. So why should I need to go for a meeting? So they just stay in the comfort zone and they can sit there in a, and they complain. You know, they're not. Same like in Taiwan, I knew it. Uh, people here, they not know what's happening in their neighborhood, actually. You know? <laughs> and there was a, a, a show about you know, dolphins I killed, the famous TV, you know, the, the cove. And when they asked the people in uh, Japan that you guys killed most dolphins in the world, and they're like, do we? No, they're cute. And they, they're not aware of the things around their neighborhood because now that we are living in a, you know, the world uh, that we got news through the Facebook. People, people think that news is actually <laughs> through the Facebook. They read news from the Facebook and they actually take it as a news. Uh, so uh, students like Nahid and young guys that, that what we're doing is that what we need to get and make that action to be vibrant. And we need to tell these politicians, the politicians are also us. Uh, it's not a bad thing. We need to make them to that what we want. And as Gandhi said that politicians are not different from the society. They are just a mirror reflection of what you want. So if you get a shortcut, they're going to take the shortcut too. So as we are, we need to tell them, no, this is not what we want. We want different way. 
But the problem, we never use it. We have a short memory like a goldfish. We will forget and they will come up with something and we will emotionally move to them. Uh, so a different way. So we need to stick with the priority and think critically and be optimistic. That's what I think. Okay, thank you, Ronnie. We can discuss it further. Right now, we are uh, running a little late. Andrea is, uh, I can't find us. He might have some problem from Guatemala. So we're looking for her. We have Francis Bizoska, and Ivan is also waiting at 30 and 9 o'clock. We're joined with this Tapnio from Philippines. So we will rush it for a little bit. I'll request Francis to hurry through the presentation. But before that, I request you to invite uh, uh, from Taiwan. Uh, Rami, hand it over to you. Yeah, please, uh, teacher, uh, please request sir, to Haripur uh, because Ivan is yeah. waiting and we need to finish by 9 o'clock. Okay, uh, JK, sir, can you please let the teacher for you to share her screen? Not a difficult means. I raise my hand. <laughs> you can, you can share your screen now. <laughs> okay, you see YouTube. my screen now? Yes, we can see your screen. Okay, yes. so let me introduce. Okay. Uh, thank you, and it's my pleasure. And uh, because when I met Ronnie, I call he is a climate warrior. And I'm also take action as a junior high school, Chongqing. And uh, I, this is our school in New Taipei City, Taiwan. And uh, this is me. I am an international educator and also an English teacher. But um, before three years ago, when I take action on climate change project, I face a big problem that students have no empathy, people have no feeling, and teachers have no professional knowledge. So as an educator, I take real action. I am training uh, climate change lessons much more than 100 hours, and this year I will also to be trained and to be a climate uh, climbing change action where we are now. <laughs> I will join Ronnie's uh, line. Okay, uh, today I would like to share that maybe I'm so uh, appreciate and so impressive that the Mexico students, um, you share the very great action plan, but in Taiwan, we're just the beginning. We're just the learn from you. That's why I'm here. And I also uh, take my students to share with our project. What we educators as a teacher in Chongqing Junior High School, what can we do and how we do it? Let me share our subject uh, project school stories. Okay, let me introduce myself. My name is Chen Hui Yu, but you can call me for you. And uh, let me introduce my student, uh, Yu Chen Gao. Yu Chen, hello, say hi to everyone. Hello, everyone. I'm Yu Chen Gao, and I'm 13 years old, seventh grader in Chongqing Junior High School, and it's my pleasure to be here. Um, in our school, we have 1,500 make students and 163 teachers. We also have the school children of fac faculty and staff can be well taken care of. My school CCJH has already won the new Taipei City CCOC connecting classrooms online community class excellent model school prize in 2018, and luckily we won the spring honor again this year, 2021. In the new era of the 20, 21st century, other countries are eagerly discussing topics in addition to economic, technological, development, and environmental protections. Canadian educator, educator Michael Fullen proposed that the framework of talent capabilities in 21st century includes creative communication, collaboration, creative thinking, character development, and global citizenship. We use well managed PB, PBL, what we call project based learning, teaching strategies, teachers not only read students, these students to discover and connect with the world through online video sessions, 
but we also arrange a half day tour for students to walk, read, and feel their city in which they live. We encourage our students to learn PBL for them can learn sexy 21st skills. Uh, let me show you how much effort our seven to eight grader work so hard on SDG 15 and enjoy it. This is our school, a student and our school dog. Our school day last year is on November 14th. Uh, happy birthday to CCJH, 45 years old. Well, now take a look at our project number one. We respect life on land. Love campus dog and our god dogs. And project number two. Cultural box SDG 15 box. Exchange cultural box. Not just about it. Well. Exchange cultural box and postcards wisely. Take the chance. Put your SDG 15 ideas. More than 10 countries know endangered animals in your country. For example, our endangered animals are Formosan black bears. One Indian New Delhi school sent us back their cute tiger doll in their box. Students all fell in love with our foremost and black bear. When partner schools opened our cultural box, so lovely. They touch it, held it, and treat the bear as their dearest classmate and their best friend. Yes, that's it. So called emotional education and moral education when they have strong feelings for animals. Well, how can they not love them? And we also have PBL differentiation teaching strategies. Advanced pro project. Two, through grouping, find information on the internet, explore, think fair, share, and present in groups. And project number three. I earn my storybook project. Solitary store project. Well, alone we do little, together we can do very much. And try, try this out. BBL3 Advanced Local Biodiversity. Butterfly and Beauty Math plus SDG 15 Mathematical Symmetric Patterns and Butterfly Ecological Panning Learning Sheet. Well, that's our students' beautiful painting of butterfly. EBL 04 Right or right, student write a letter to defender of forest or their homeland. And BBL 05, let's play. Forest protector board games. Taiwan species. species. Leopard, leopard cat. Save the forest board games. And PBL 6, balance between urban and rural development and animals habitat protection. Arrange a uh, walk and read your city tour for your student. Let's walk the land they live. Enjoy watching the butterfly in the sky and listen to the story of the river. Authentic. Knowledge 
visual thinking and draw their city in the future. Well, global educators make a change, make a difference. Hope you will enjoy the school story I shared today. And remember to try PBL maybe next time. And I'm Yu Shen Gao from Taiwan. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's our sharing. Uh, Ronnie, you're mute. You're mute. Okay. Thank Thanks you. a lot, Yu Shen Gao. And uh, as I mentioned to you, we will have Act Now Club and the Culture Box is one of the great ideas that we will try to implement through the Act Now Club uh, because Culture Box is the one you can put it things that means to you and you send to you know, different countries. And in Taiwan is a very famous hit one. Uh, so hopefully uh, through the Act Now Club, you guys can all participate and we can have the exchange of Culture Box one. And also one of the teachers from Taiwan, Vini, she's doing linking every country through the uh, bear. So black bears is a foremost black bear is the only the biggest mammal in Taiwan left. So she's trying her best to connect all the countries to the black bears, okay, different bears one. So hopefully you can all join ACNA Club and Raju will send you information. Please feel free to contact him sure. and hopefully we can stand united one and work across the different uh, clubs and uh, platform uh, because otherwise we are scattered. We action matters, we can stay united together. So please uh, keep in touch with the uh, Act Now Club and try to join and we will forward most information and news to you as long as we get it. Okay, Rajiv. Yeah, yeah definitely we, we have already started here. So we are looking forward uh, Ronnie, your school and Mam is school and all. So the students, they will exchange their ideas and they will have a lot of uh, program online. After pandemic, you know, like we can uh, do anything sitting at home and maybe far away. Yeah, th that was a really cool. Last time we did the hunger project one, my students in grade four yes, and yes. we worked with the JK thing. But students in Taiwan, they really don't know what is a hunger means. But when they see yeah. the pictures from JK's uh, students, they went to the uh, slum near the train station and gave the food. And it was a call that my students, great four kids, they want to help. And for them, the best thing they can serve is noodles. And so <laughs> they want to bring in noodles and sit. And I told them, uh, I don't think they eat noodles there. <laughs> and so they said, ah, huh? yeah, I don't think people in India, they eat noodles like you guys do it every often. So, and they started to figure out what, what we can do it, you know, what we can help. So even from the grade four kids, they want the action. You know, they think that it, it matters. Uh, so we would have a great uh, young generation coming. Only thing we just need to make them powerful. When they knew that the action matters, uh, they want to learn it. Otherwise, they don't want to learn. That's what I can. When the action okay. matters, yes. they will. Yeah. Okay. Thank yes. you, Ronnie. Thank you, JK. Hmm. I'm sorry to interrupt. We are at the close of this session, and we have two guests already waiting. Ivan Ransom is from Mexico. He's a sustainable ambassador and he's also the co-founder of Exchange 2020. We are running a little late, and before that, we have Francis De Souza. We have been looking for you. It's early morning in. Uh, South Sudan. He has joined from South Sudan. He's an interesting person and he comes from a very remote location. It looks like because there's so much so less light over there. So Francis Vizosa, I would request you to run up your presentation quickly enough. So if Iman has to present one and nine o'clock, we begin the last and closing session of this event, this 24-hour marathon. Thank you, Iman, because Pop family has been uh, with us since the mm -hmm. last 12 hours, last 24 hours, and we have had everybody speaking up there. Perhaps you are the last one from the pop family to pop up here and we are looking forward to that. So I'll hand it over to Francis with a request to just uh, make a small introduction for the benefit of our younger audience. And then I hand it over to Ivan. And at 9 o'clock, we'll be joined by, by an uh, interesting person who is the alumni of Yale University. He runs a mangrove project in Philippines. And then we have the closing ceremony that will follow up after that in the last session. So Francis, up to you. Up with your presentation. Okay, uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, everyone. I am very excited to be joining now and, and to share a few things that uh, we are doing from my side. Unfortunately, we 
we have a uh, trouble with uh, electricity uh, there is not enough electricity here it looks like yeah it, look, it looks like it's in the net yeah it happened last time too you know, unfortunately technology yeah uh francis you can maybe you can turn off uh, your screen maybe you uh, know you can talk because when you turn on your like uh, your camera maybe the network connection is not that good so when we run out of our batteries electricity that is what happens what happens when we run out of resources on this planet yeah be, be, yeah it's also uh, raji these are the thing initiative we can start you know helping each other because if, if in other side we have the technology like taiwan we do have enough technology uh, and resources are only in, in the one place so i think if we can move those resources to other side we can share uh, i think it, it will make a difference and uh, this kind of initiative I, will I, help it i'll i'll send a big carrier ship over there anyway over to since we we, we are waiting for francis dijuja because this is the concept behind uh, no one ransom sustainability is sustainable ambassador and resilience 2020 is all about building up the resilience of our resources isn't it so over to you ivan and when francis is able to join us he will be back us ron just make a request to him you can join any time until 12 o'clock he is welcome yeah, yeah. so i'll hand it over to okay. ivan he is a very interesting concept that they brought in mexico so ivan please introduce yourself a bit about your work yourself and a bit about your work to the younger audience and then get ahead with it take your time thank you so much and thank you all for being here and it is a really really huge honor for us to being able to present in such a a huge and inspiring event full of great people. So I'm Ivan Ransom, I'm uh, from Mexico and I'm a, a sustainability specialist. I did the career as cellular and molecular biologist, but now I'm focusing on sustainability uh, full time. So um, I'm going to talk to you about resilience 2020, but specifically about the circular economy uh, and how we are uh, implementing it. So. If I'm able to share my screen, I'm going to start with the presentation. So just to check, everyone can see it, right? Okay, well, so about circular economy. We know that our ways to produce and consume has made us reach a point of almost no return in human history and also for many species. This way of producing and consuming is generating huge environmental impacts and also keeping us closer and closer to the uh, planetary boundaries. And we need to stop that and start thinking about our planet and also the species that we share our planet with. So what is li linear economy? Uh, just a quick reminder, linear economy is like the traditional one in which we have uh, the raw materials or, or, or the natural resources, then we start putting them into, um, into industries to manufacture the products, then sell them, and ultimately they're going to end up in trash. That is the, the kind of economy that is affecting the world the most. Then in order to uh, try to prevent these kind of behaviors and this kind of consumption, economy of recycling was created. This is mainly focused on reduce, reuse, and recycle. However, this is not the best possible way either. Circular economy, on the other hand, is a way in which uh, people or conscious uh, people, consumers, producers are trying to create products that have high value and to keep the high value as long as possible into the uh, into the system, right? So we could see as a schematic representation like this, linear economy, pretty much everything goes to waste. Uh, at the end, recycling economy is going to last a little bit uh, before going to, to waste. It's going to be less waste, but still too much. And then circular economy, which the, the waste is going to be reduced as much as possible. Then from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which are a specialist in um, circular economy, they made this the so-called um, butterfly scheme. In this way, we have in the right side, the technical cycle and in the left one, the biological one. 
So the technical cycle is pretty much everything that that is not organic materials, let's say metals and plastics and all that that can be can, that can have another use that can be recycled, uh, refurbished, and etc. So um, in the biological one, on the other hand, all of these nutrients, all this organic matter, is going to return to the soil and to nature, which is the natural cycle, right? So, as I was telling you, uh, ultimately, the, the end of this the, um, is that we can keep the materials at their highest pos possible value as long as possible before they uh, go to waste and obviously minimizing that at, as much as possible. And well, for this, uh, we need to rethink the system. So, this is something that I really like about circular economy. It's not uh, only like some kind of squared and uh, rigid system. You need to think to, to be creative, to innovate. So uh, I just brought two examples for you. This is a company called Replenish 3.0. And here, instead of just uh, selling you all the product uh, in a bottle that you're, you're going to end up throwing to, to the garbage, they just sell you, well, these kind of bottles, but the, the part in the bottom can be uh, replaced and filled with uh, the new, let's say, soap or the product that the product that they want to sell. So you just fill it with water, and they are saving you uh, some money, and they are saving money for themselves, and also, and they are reducing uh, trash generation. Then this is also a great uh, company. This is Toast Ale, and what they start doing is they take a bread that otherwise will go to waste. And they use they use it as raw material to create beer. This is something really nice. And well, here are we Resilience 2020. I just want to say, well, Kevin presented uh, some hours ago, and I'm presenting now. We are the co-founders. However, I will just want to say that we are not the only ones. We have a team of over uh, 20 people doing this. So um, the thing is, people in rural and urban areas usually feel themselves to be disconnected. But through this, our planet is uh, is one and we are all connected. And we also all depend on each other and the environment. So uh, what we are doing is trying to take uh, the good things about technology, these kind of developments, and use them for the sake of people and the environment. What we're doing here uh, is to install ecotechnologies for free I'm not going to go deep into this because Kevin already told about that. However, well, through these eco-technologies, we create a circular economy system, which uh, ultimately is going to change the way of produce and consume of people, right? So how does it work? Uh, the cir circular economy system that we have, we install the eco-technologies at homes. Then they're going to produce uh, products or of products. Let, let's say uh, about the biodigester, which is one of our main eco-technologies. So we install the biodigester, you put organic matter in there and also water, it's going to produce bile and biogas. Uh, the bile, we are, it's a liquid organic fertilizer, which we are going to sell to the producers in rural areas at a competitive price. And it's the price so cheap that they can even, uh, it's at the same price as the cheapest uh, synthetic one in the market. And one of the advantages that we have is, as this is uh, a fertilizer created from organic matter and water, uh, the price is not going to go up as the uh, crude and petrol uh, starts going up their prices. So they can keep the, the, their economy safer for longer. And also they are going to start producing organic food, which can also be sold uh, in a higher price. We are going to buy those food from them if they agree. Uh, through a uh, fair trade scheme so that they are the main benefited from their work. And we're going to sell those products back into the cities, which, which then are going to uh, feed the biodigesters again, and then the cycle starts again. This way, we're trying to cycle the nutrients and also prevent uh, synthetic fertilizers and um, this kind of industrial agriculture, which is so damaging for the environment to keep happening. We're trying to change the system in this way. So uh, the monthly products per household are 
uh, 210 kilos of fertilizer for sales. And I'm not going to read all of that, but uh, we are uh, benefiting the environment. We are creating healthier uh, food for everyone. And also uh, allowing them to have additional income, uh, which otherwise they wouldn't be able to. And also they can uh, receive this kind of capacitation, uh, capacity building and training so that they can also start their own um, enterprises and selling organic uh, materials and also bio and what they are uh, interested in. We also are really committed to personal and professional growth of the people that are inside our, our system. So uh, one of the, also the benefits that we have, we are for the biodigester, let's say, and the compost, we are splitting from the source, the organic from the inorganic matter. So this means that we are going to have, um, we're going to separate these two from the source. So uh, recycling is going to be way, way more effective. But what also is the meaning of this? So there are many people uh, in landfills trying to look for something valuable right and as organic matter is also there it's going to start decomposing which is also going to start creating methane and other um greenhouse gases which are uh, affecting our our planet so much the thing is it's not only that it's not only the cases but also they are going to be exposed to many uh health issues uh, these people are also really, really born vulnerable because they their economy is really uh, fragile. And if they become ill because some of these, uh, let's say, vectors or diseases that they are going to find in the landfills, then that's going to affect them way, way worse than anyone else. So we are preventing these kind of situations as well. And finally, uh, we are uh, preventing the damages and affectations of species, especially those uh, that are most closely related to agricultural lands. So in this way, we are also uh, helping the environment to protect biodiversity and to reduce uh, water, air and soil pollution while we create uh, sources of economy uh, that are better for the planet. And well, I'm going to uh, finish my presentation by giving you this example. It's not only about uh, the economy and how these systems can work, but also about coexisting and helping each other. This picture that I am showing you here is about uh, Mayan milpa. This is a way in which, in which Mayans uh, put their crops. So they're putting three different plants in here, the corn, the squash and the squash and the beans. So how do they have this synergy? The corn provides structure for the beans to climb and reach the sunlight. The beans uh, in the roots have these nodules which are going to fix nitrogen from the atmosphere, which is going to help uh, corn and also quash to get these, uh, these nutrients. And quash through their really wide leaves are going to prevent um, soil, er soil erosion through water and through sun, and are going to create this microclimate that is good for all of the plants. So this is a really smart and environmentally conscious way that Mayans have been planting their crops. And this is what we are trying to do to help each other to grow as one and protect our planet and protect this uh, system that we share. And well, if you have any other question, um, please feel free to contact us. Thank you. Thank you, Ivan, so much. Uh, yeah, I was I was wondering when you sent me this resilience 2020 twice uh, uh, because it was launched in 2020. I I thought I was relating it to something that happened during the pandemic and how we are building resilience towards it. But it's a combination of both, isn't it? Building resilience. Uh, it's a, uh, I mean, uh, it's a kind of presentation that uh, that actually seeks at implementing things at the ground level and connecting things together. So again, Ivan, thank you so much. You've been